You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. My bias is is partly to blame, but it, it wasn't without actually intentionally trying to figure out where my bias was preventing me. So what I mean is I actually went out there and looked for disconfirming evidence. So this is, I'm talking about confirmation bias here. And uh, I was looking for disconfirming evidence. And the mistake I made is that the disconfirming evidence might actually be true. And uh, in my analysis, I said, no, it's going to be overcome. And, and again, this is, this is, this is, this is how you make mistakes in the business. And and maybe this mistake isn't going to, maybe it will end up playing out, but uh, as, to today it hasn't. Welcome back to Money Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers, speaking today with Brian Lenny of JuniorStockReview.com and also a part-time host of the Mining Stock Education podcast. Brian, welcome on to the show as a guest. You were at uh, Toronto for six days recently for three mining conferences. So a mining conference uh, marathon for you there. Tell us about it and specifically what was investor sentiment like as you experienced it? Oh, thanks for having me, Bill. Uh, yeah, so I was there for Red Cloud, uh, Metals Investors Forum, and PDAC. And I think all around, I think uh, sentiment was pretty good. Uh, mind you, I think in some regards, it was a little bit lighter than um, I would have hoped after Vancouver and, and kind of doing the two conferences uh, in Vancouver. I thought, you know, there was a potential for it to be a lot more. Uh, but, but from what we've seen in the market just after Vancouver, so after the end of January, the market really went for a little bit of a turn there. And uh, I think that that did affect uh, things. The other side to it is we had a storm in Toronto. And so those first two conferences were definitely affected with flights bombing. And uh, and so that definitely had, had an effect. The other side to it in terms of sentiment, I would say the people that I spoke to were generally optimistic about the future. And I, I think that speaks to um, maybe that bump we had in November, December-ish and what that kind of brought to the market. You know, some money flowed back in. And so people are looking to the future with with optimism. And so overall, I thought it was it was a great six days. It was a long six days, uh, but it was it was definitely worth my time. What about commodity wise? Like what were some of the hot commodities that people talked about? Uh, well, you know, it was, it's, it's hard not to, to listen and, and see the impact of critical mater- materials or metals, however you want to put it, uh, in the sector. One of the biggest things that I had it happen on a couple occasions, I was at a club booth and then a group of politicians came up behind and kind of overtook the whole area. And, uh, this, this was kind of a common theme of this, these mobs of politicians walking throughout PDAC and going to certain booths where they've either awarded money or I guess are in the process of, of, of possibly awarding money. And, uh, it was funny. I was at the one booth. It was a, it was a graphite company and, uh, I didn't know anything about the company. So I was going through their, their corporate deck with, uh, one of the guys and they come up behind and again, they, they took over and the guy I was talking to, I think he was the, the chief operating officer or something like that. And so he got taken away. And so a couple of politicians came up to me. And, uh, one of the things that I was kind of left with is like, wow, you know, I knew, I knew the politicians really didn't know what they were investing in, but talking to these guys, <laughs> listening to what they thought about this graphite company, because I asked them a couple of questions, they have really not a clue. And, uh, I, so I, I, I think it's quite interesting to see that we're headed towards this this critical mineral um, future and importance, yet the government and the government's dishing out all this money, yet they really have no idea. So hopefully they have some good advisors and they're putting their money in the right spot because, you know, they've never seen money evaporate so quickly as it probably can in the the metals and minerals uh, sector. Yeah, but they're playing with somebody else's money. You and I invest with our own money. So it's more painful when we lose, right? (laughs) That's right. That's right. What about CEO sentiment? Uh, When you're talking to CEOs, I've been to the conference over the years. I wasn't there this year. Sometimes they, you could feel like they're trying to project project a positive attitude. Other times I've been told it's tough out there, you know, and what are you waiting for, for your catalyst? I'm waiting for the gold price to go up. Some of them have even told me in the past. Right. You know, it it was quite interesting because I think, I think it kind of the, the stalwart answer is, and it still holds true is those guys that seemingly have access to cash, um, they're usually the most positive guys you're going to meet. And that continues to be the way there's a, there's a few guys that I've met that I've never thought would have problems, uh, getting cash and they're not, you know, they just closed the one guy, I think it was seven and a half million dollar financing. 
and uh, it's they had a full book and no issues whatsoever. On the other side, I was talking to a couple smaller companies and they had trouble getting a million, million and a half. And really, you know, these days, what is that going to do for you? Uh, it's really like a generative program. You're probably not going to get much, at least diamond core drilling. And uh, and so it shows you the two contrasts and how important attracting, being able to raise or attract the money is. And, you know, I think that continues to be the the one of the big points in the sector is those companies that haven't been able to raise the cash at the right time, um, even with this kind of maybe rosier future in place, are still having a little bit of trouble finding it. And I think that sort of continues. Uh, the other side, again, I think it depends, uh, you know, what type of metal or mineral the the company is looking for. You know, a lot of the gold companies, I, can, I would say, are definitely not um, as in as nice of a position as if you talk to the lithium companies, like the amount of lithium companies at PDAC this year was through the roof. And, you know, there's there's good reason. And it's also a sign that, you know, there's a lot of junk out there, too. And so investors have to be that much more careful for these companies that have remarketed themselves into lithium companies that, you know, two months ago were gold companies or silver companies or whatever they were. Um, so again, depending on what that metal or mineral you're you're looking for, or that group of people that you look uh, or are a part of in the in the industry, definitely uh, says to the to me, anyways, what what how you see the market right now, and what you're optimistic or not optimistic about the future. What about jurisdictional breakouts? A lot of times, there you can learn about a jurisdiction you might not know about. Was there any that sessions that you attended? Uh, you know what. I, no, actually, I, I spend all my time, and this is usually what I do at especially PDAC is is basically time for me to network first first and foremost, and then do one on one company meetings. And this is both me, you know, reaching out to companies and them reaching out to me. Um, I didn't attend any of the the kind of jurisdictional stuff, but I'm still sort of interested because I've got my ear and to the ground, and that's I was listening. One of the interesting things that I'll say about Canada, for instance, there's definitely been a staking rush in the you know northern Manitoba, and I think that this area probably becomes more and more popular, just like we saw in maybe not Newfoundland. The Newfoundland had newfound gold and this this amazing discovery to kind of push everybody into Newfoundland and really made it hot a couple of years ago. But northern Manitoba, there's a you know, people are looking for this new, you know, untapped or unstaked land. And so if you look at the amount of companies that have staked ground in northern Manitoba, I think it's it's quite high. And uh maybe it needs a discovery to get really hot. And that's usually what is the prelude. Uh, but I think just the fact that a lot of companies are putting attention up there, you know, says that this is probably the next area uh that that investors may want to be looking at. Uh, Echelon Wealth Partners out of Toronto and PI Financial out of Vancouver are merging. Uh, I saw online some people were saying that rumor was going around PDAC while you guys were there. Uh, did you hear about that? And what are your thoughts of this? And what does it mean for the in industry? No, I didn't hear about that. Actually, okay. I saw it after the fact. Okay, <laughs> um, but but um, I think you know I think these sorts of things are 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 net good, especially on on that area where I think. You know, a bigger entity uh, with those two guys combined, the amount of clients, the amount of, of money, I think that is probably a good thing for the for the business. And I don't know either PI Financial or or um, or Echelon, you know, that well. But I would say again, these are these are good things to see. And uh, just like mergers and acquisitions in the in the the juniors, I think this is this is you know what you see at the top or not the top, but the uh, how do you put it? The it's a good sign of, of the market of moving forward. You know that deals are getting done and that people are looking to consolidate and, and grab more power while it's available at this kind of bottom of the market. And so again, I, I think it's a it's a net good move uh, for the business, and it's probably not the last one that we see. Your bias is losing your money was your presentation <laughs> title for Metals Investor Forum. Could you give us kind of a synoptic and uh, synopsis and like what were some of the high points of that that message? Sure. So one of the one of the things that I constantly do, especially with some of my mentors, is talk about where I've made my mistakes. And in particular, my mentor and I have both invested in a company, and really the investment thesis hasn't played out how we would, would have thought. And um, you know, this is despite good news. And so we had we had had a couple of discussions about why this was happening. We're trying to really understand. And I think that you know. Your bias or my bias is, is is partly to blame, 
but it, it wasn't without actually intentionally trying to figure out where my bias was preventing me. So what I mean is I actually went out there and looked for disconfirming evidence. So this is, I'm talking about confirmation bias here. And uh, I was looking for disconfirming evidence. And the mistake I made is that the disconfirming evidence might actually be true. And uh, in my analysis, I said, no, it's going to be overcome. And, and again, this is, this is, this is, this is how you make mistakes in the business. And and maybe this mistake isn't going to, maybe it will end up playing out, but uh, as, to today, it hasn't. Uh, but these are the questions you have to ask yourself is when you go out there and you make an investment thesis, you have all these beliefs of, of how this is going to play out, but you need to go out there and you need to say, okay, well, how does the market view this company? You look at those views and you say, okay, well, are, are these real or can these be overcome? And so, you know, stuff like mineral processing issue or a jurisdictional issue, these things are tough issues to overcome. And really, you better make sure that you have not only the knowledge, um, but you have to have confidence in the management team's ability to deal with those issues and get a positive uh, outcome. Um, so confirmation bias is, is, is a huge thing. We all need to keep that at the forefront. The other thing that I spent more time in my presentation was the misweighing bias. And the misweighing bias is doing the right things, but in the wrong order. And I equated it to, you know, trying to live a healthier life. And so if you rank the first thing that you probably need to do to live a healthier life is eat, eat well and drink well, and then, you know, breathe good air quality sleep, and then good exercise. So those are kind of your top four things. However, the market or, you know, everybody out there is going to market you, get a gym membership, you know, take take your vitamins, all these things. And you'll see that all of these things are ranked under how you, you eat and drink. So basically what I'm saying is you can go get a gym membership, but if you don't change what you're eating and drinking, most likely you're not going to get the best impact out of that gym membership. So you're spending 40 minutes in the gym, but it's not giving you that maximum appeal or maximum, you know, weight loss or cardiovascular. And so you really have to uh, look at the way in the order you do things. And if you parlay that to the resource sector and investing, in my view, uh, you've got kind of these, these five things that I've, I've, talked about in the last, you know, three or four presentations. Um, and basically it starts with self-awareness is knowing who you are as an investor, what you're looking for, your, your risk tolerance, what you know, and what you don't know, your, your investment timeline. You need to get all these things sorted out first before you can kind of work down the, the, the hierarchy of, of investment stuff as such as using the price to value ratio until you know what you want and what you're looking for. There's no way you can go out and buy a company or buy a company that's selling for less than it's worth. So again, Misweighing bias is is a big deal, and uh, you will be that much more successful, in my view, if you you take a look and employ it in your day to day investing. So, Brian, the unnamed com- company that you mentioned that you were talking through with your mentor, did you end up selling it because it didn't perform the way you thought, or how did you uh, go about dealing with no. that position? No, I haven't. I haven't sold it, and um, and maybe it's <laughs> maybe I'm. This, this is why I say it's, it's not, I'm not necessarily wrong yet. Uh, but again, I might be. <laughs> and that's kind of where I'm, I'm sitting right now. There's a few things that are, that should be happening in the next six months that will tell me whether this needs to be sold or, or not. And so it basically has, you know, six months, maybe seven months, depending on if, if there's delays. And, uh, and that'll tell me if the market truly isn't going to recognize the value in the company. Um, and that, that's just the way that, that things go. And, uh, and again, you know, maybe in some cases in retrospect, I'll look back at this and say, maybe I should have sold it today. Um, but it's, it's tough. And this is, this, but these are the decisions you have to make as an investor and you kind of live and die by them as, as you sort of speak. So, um, we'll see, see where it goes. So when you're looking at a development play, you're looking at specific discounts that the market may be given a play. Maybe it's jurisdictional or maybe they don't like the management team or the, it, the grade is too low. What are the most uh, acceptable discounts that, y- that you'll accept and invest in a, a, a development play? The the best one for me, the one that I, I really salvate over is the ones that have done lack of promotion. Um, the ones that have, you know, a terrible corporate that are debt. willing to do more promotion though, hopefully, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the key. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah, because that's it goes hand in hand, right? So you find the problem and then you just have to see how it's going to be resolved, right? Um, but the lack of promotion, I think, is is the biggest one that people need to look for. Like you've got good people, a good project, and they've got had good results, and their underlying value is 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 low 
uh, or their price is low uh, in relation to their value, this is prime. Um, because to me, you know, promotion, people start talking about it, it has kind of this contagion effect and can really catch on. And so that's definitely something that that I look for. Uh, jurisdiction, I, I think jurisdiction can be uh, overcome too. Uh, you know, it, it depends. Um, I think you can invest in bad jurisdictions at the wrong times. Like if, you know, coming up to an election that, you know, where a country might be heading a little bit down the left wing <laughs> path, um, I think, you know, you're setting yourself up for probably some potential issues. Uh, so your timing matters. Uh, but, you know, again, I think the jurisdiction, like look at Argentina. Argentina has been a basket case for 20 years, 20 plus years. And it's going to continue that way, really. Like the, 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 they haven't done anything in my view that is, that is said, Oh, you know what? The culture's changing and they're going to go down the right path. That said, look what, you know, if you're located in Salta or San Juan and you've had good results, you know, Philo Mining, you know, Abra Silver, like these companies have shown huge gains over the last year, two years. And it shows you that the market will recognize the results if you know, if you're in those maybe two provinces in Argentina and you've had some really good, compelling results. And so, again, I think jurisdiction can be overcome, but it needs a set criteria of of how you're you're going about it. And so, yeah, those are two things that I would definitely look at that can be overcome and mineral processing or social license issue, like a community issue. Um, those are things that I would say you have to put a red flag on and really put some thought into whether they can be overcome or what timeline it's going to take. As you just articulated, when you look at Argentina, though, you're going to look at the provincial level, though. You're going to look at Salta and you're going to say this is a better uh, jurisdiction to invest in within Argentina. Because like from our North American perspective, we just say Argentina, but it's a country with different provinces, you said. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look at, you know, perfect. You know, Canadian and Americans can say, is there a difference between each state in America? I would say Nevada versus California. right? (laughs) I would say very much so. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that's you probably that's the prime mining example, California versus Nevada. They're right beside each other, yet are polar opposites in terms of how they treat miners. And so, you know, these are the things like the the macro, you could have a macro view on a country and it's probably correct. And whatever you come up with, like that's usually what you're seeing in the, the news and the headlines has probably got some truth to it. Uh, but it's very much the micro. And even at the state level, you can say, okay, there's 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 towns and cities that can have problems in local communities. Um, so you do have to go to the locale of where that project's located and make sure the social license is is good in good standing with that mining company because you can have you can have a good state and then you can have problems at the local level so yeah it's it's definitely a macro and a micro thing and i think that stuff can be overcome right timing and uh, of course the right results Brian, have you given much thought to how this banking crisis in the u.s right now we're seeing uh, regional banks on the west coast and east coast need to be bailed out and bought by a bigger bank. So the Fed stepping in here, do you think that this is going to create a liquidity crisis, which would of course ex- uh, affect the small caps that we invest in? Uh, does this concern you at all as a small cap investor? Uh, no. <laughs> it's a kind of a loaded question because on one hand, you know, Bill, I don't, I'm not sure that I know enough about the, the, the risks with these, these different size banks and how they're all tied in. I don't know enough about how that sort of contagion works. But what I'll say is more the actions by the Fed and, and what investors need to, to look at are, and they're the important thing. You know, basically they're saying they're going to bail out. They're going to guarantee deposits. They're going to back any bad debt as if it were prime. Um, you, you look at these few points and it kind of falls in place of what we saw in the past. And it, we, we've seen what happened. So is there a risk to, to a crash or this contagion happening? I would say probably, absolutely. We saw it happen before. Uh, do the probability of it? I, I don't know. But the Fed is taking the exact same stance that they did last time. And we saw where that went. And I think that's what investors need to pay attention to and sort of set their portfolios up for. And uh, having some cash at this moment in time is definitely not a bad thing. And uh, who knows what the future will bring. But you know, you stick to the good companies. You see kind of where this thing is headed. We, we've we sort of known this is where it was headed, but we just didn't know when. And maybe this is our first marker to say, hey, look, at it, this is beginning. So, yep. Brian's website is juniorstockreview.com. Go over there and check it out if you're not familiar with his work. As always, Brian, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your insights. And thank you for giving uh, us your take on PDAC and the corresponding conferences. Thanks, Bill. 